so you mentioned Global Climate Alliance. Global means who will be the members then? The members for the Global Climate Alliance uh, will be countries uh, that do want to uh, take on these accelerated decarbonization targets. Uh, in the Global North, we have seen already uh, that whether it's the EU, uh, Canada, Australia, the UK, New Zealand, uh, these countries have already uh, made legally binding commitments uh, in their uh, parliaments uh, to get to net zero by 2050. Mm -hmm. uh, the US is also committing to uh, very aggressively drive decarbonization uh, through the recently passed uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, so these uh, efforts are already underway in the Global North. And so we would expect Global North countries to be members of a Global Climate Alliance mm -hmm. because uh, that will be a motivation and an incentive for members of the Global South as well. But equally, we would like members of the Global South to be a part of this alliance so that they can also benefit uh, from the support of the Global North in this. And we have a very, very important opportunity to accelerate all these discussions, Karen, because India is going to be assuming the G20 presidency uh, in December of this year. Mm -hmm. And through that uh, presidency, we have an opportunity to put forward a proposal for a Global Climate Alliance building on the work that Germany did when it was the G7 uh, president uh, and where they introduced this idea of an open and inclusive climate club, uh, we could take forward that proposal, that thinking, uh, and bring it uh, you know, to the G20 and really make it a platform for countries that want to accelerate their decarbonization efforts. Motivation element. Is there a motivation element within the, how you will convince the member states to come? Well, there has to be uh, a strong set of incentives mm -hmm. uh, for the Global South to be a member of such a Global Climate Alliance. As I said, most countries in the Global North have already made commitments and are making very substantial investments to decarbonize. The challenge for the Global South is that even though net zero is net positive and it is better for them whether we look at it in terms of GDP, jobs, air pollution, dependency on fossil fuels, any parameter that we look at, uh, it is actually better for us to move towards net zero. But it requires very substantial amounts of capital, well beyond uh, the mobilization capabilities of the Global South. And it requires uh, a host of new technologies, whether they are battery technologies, uh, whether they are uh, green hydrogen technologies, biofuel technologies, all of these new technologies are going to be required to get onto the decarbonization pathway. So the incentive for the members of the Global South is that they will get the support of the Global North uh, to decarbonize. So that really becomes, in a way, uh, the, 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 the quid pro quo uh, that this climate alliance uh, will, will try and set up. Uh, the Global North uh, will provide support, financial, technology, policy support, all of these ways in which they can support the Global South. The Global South will benefit from that support and in, and in, in, in turn, the Global South will commit to much more aggressive decarbonization targets than they would have otherwise. So that's why people will join. The Global North will join because we all know that a world that gets to net zero makes us much safer and prevents the disastrous impact of climate change. And of course, the Global South benefits because uh, there's faster GDP growth, there's more job creation, there's less air pollution, and we get the support uh, from a capital perspective, from a technology perspective, and a policy perspective from the Global North. So it's a win-win-win. The North wins, the South wins, and the planet wins. And most importantly, Karen, our children win. Because, exactly. because we are able to uh, pre uh, prevent uh, you know, global warming to exceed you know, one and a half, two degrees centigrade, which is what we all agreed to during the Paris Agreement. You mentioned Paris Agreement. So what commitments the member states would need to make? What the first is climate alliance from Paris Agreement commitments the member states there did. So what, what, is, what is the commitment you ask the member states? So we hope to go beyond the Paris Agreement, Karen. What okay. we would like to do uh, is we would like all member countries of the Global Climate Alliance to commit on a legally uh, binding basis to net zero targets and not just net zero targets uh, on a far off date, not just 2050 or 2060 or 2070, but to show in a very tangible and material way that they're getting on decarbonization pathways 
that are going to bend the curve that are going to make a difference to carbon emissions even in the next few years so we would like everyone to commit to some very substantial and very material targets uh, on decarbonization by 2025 Uh, and this includes both global north countries as well as global south countries now obviously those targets will be different for different countries and this is part of working uh, out you know what is required in the global climate alliance but in return for that as i said we will get financial technology and policy support from the global north uh, coming in to the global south so that's how we go beyond the paris agreement where there are very tangible commitments both in terms of decarbonization targets and very tangible commitments in terms of financial and technology flows you mentioned finance investments how will the global climate alliance get the financial flows necessary you know karen that uh, it's been very difficult to generate the climate finance for the global south uh, to be able to get to net zero uh, we are still trying uh, to make the 100 billion dollars that was promised in the paris agreement real mm. uh, that still uh, is not uh, coming together the way i think the global south would like it to so we really have to step up what we do on the financial side to make this global climate alliance real if we don't succeed on the financial side uh, then frankly the global climate alliance really cannot move forward mm. now to do that the very important part that we do need to understand in terms of decarbonization or green investments is that the bulk of these investments perhaps 80% of these investments have to be in the private sector this has to be a market driven approach because if we are going to decarbonize power if we are going to decarbonize steel cement fertilizer aluminum if we are going to decarbonize real estate uh, all of these uh, will have to be done by the private sector everybody is going to go out and buy electric cars they're going to buy electric two wheelers and three wheelers so these are things that we have to do across the economy and largely in the private sector so this is not a question of government to government transfers of money this is a question of how do we mobilize the trillions of dollars of private capital that exists in this world to flow to the global south to be uh, invested in these green technologies that's really what we have to unlock and here the role of the multilateral development banks the ifc the world bank uh, the european investment bank the asian development bank this is very very important because they can help in reducing some of the risks some of the problems uh, that private capital deals with uh, when they are operating uh, in developing countries in low income countries and by applying you know blended capital instruments like first loss guarantees like climate insurance uh, like uh, credit guarantees of various kinds it is possible to reduce the risks that the private sector or commercial capital has to deal with and in doing so you reduce the cost of capital for green investments so today if i had to make a green investment uh, in india uh, you know it might cost me 12% uh, as a rate of return to make a green investment if i can mitigate those risks through the multilateral development banks and bring it down to 6% instead of 12% then i can unlock a lot more private sector capital and so mm-hmm. that is the role the multilateral development banks have to play and that is the support that the global north countries have to provide by scaling up the multilateral development banks providing them more capital and also directing them to really really innovate and scale up these blended capital instruments